to all that like you see live the challenges like you mm-hmm. know you have what the facade like that is very cool right nowadays it's cool to be an entrepreneur and yeah but and once you you get in the reality of it like you see how tough it is to be an entrepreneur Alex, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you, Ravi. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've been uh, talking back and forth about this. Uh, kudos to you. You kind of referred uh, a few people over to the podcast. Really cool guests. Re- really appreciate that. But um, one of the main reasons I want to have you on is for what you do for technology innovators uh, across the region. Um, mm-hmm. You know, working with Leighton. You help with uh, shred financing, so meaning you get to meet a lot of cool companies, help them gain uh, gain, gain some money back from uh, the government, which is uh, always a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, yeah, wanted to have you on, talk a little bit more about that program. You know, Shred's been around for a while, but there's still a little bit of mystery about how it works. Yeah, right? a lot of people, a lot of people don't, still don't know about it, don't know how to qualify it for it. They don't understand that uh, they, they feel like. A lot of grant grants are like you know there there's a lot to apply for a lot of paperwork a lot of things to do yeah right? and that's why having a firm like yourself um, you know uh, Leighton and um, you know an expert like you who can guide and navigate people to that process is important <laughs> so let, let's let's jump right at them and like um, how's that been for you like how that how how did you end up where you are listen this is a pretty cool story I uh, I was uh, I was working you know I, I moved to Canada six years ago and I was working in different software development companies SaaS, SaaS software mm-hmm. the last one uh, made me mostly work with corporate a little bit of a uh, little bit of startup but um, what I like is I've been reached by a uh, head hunting firm mm-hmm. that's, uh, very, uh, fresh, oh man! Uh, we, we got hit into a little bit of lag here. I don't know what's going on today, but the internet's being very laggy. Yeah. Do Do you want me to? Uh, uh, do you want me to? Like, I can switch it on my phone. Like, you know, put my my phone my phone as a modem rather than my. No, it's, it's okay. We we I've had this uh, throughout the day. Like, it seems to go in and out. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. If it really becomes a problem, we'll, we'll try to uh, patch it over. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so where, where did you lose me, pretty much? Do you want yeah, to you're, working at, you're working at a few SaaS companies? Or? Yeah, yeah. So I was working at a uh, few SaaS companies, and uh, the last one I was uh, uh, I was working with corporate, to to make it simple. And uh, I was at that time, I was starting to look at some something else. And uh, had this headhunting firm uh, talk to me about this super cool French company, fast growing. They had an office in Montreal for 10 years and uh, they wanted to open a shop in uh, April, May 2019 in Toronto. And they were looking for a bilingual guy, someone who knows a bit about tech and also about business development. So I started with Leighton in uh, in May uh, 2019 uh, with Hmm. two senior consultants. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a, great journey it's been a blessing actually we uh we started out, out of three and now we are more than 35 in the office of toronto in a time span of you know 18 months or so. <laughs> that's great and, growth. Uh, yeah that's an amazing growth uh it's uh it's because we have uh you know we are coming Leighton is coming with an approach uh that the market needs uh, mm-hmm. we are uh, basically passionate about what we do uh, we work with a lot of innovative companies, and uh, what we do is um, we bring value where uh, a lot of current players are not able to bring the way we are bringing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just to give an idea, we are signing in more than since we started on on average thirty to thirty five mandates per month, <laughs> right? So, yeah. and out, out of those thirty five. And at least four or five that comes from another provider. Mm-hmm. So that's only really twenty percent of new claimants, right? Mm-hmm. And we're talking about the SRED program that you, uh, shred program that you mentioned earlier. And the real added value, and what I liked about Leighton that, and that's what the managing director really like, you know, transferred, like you know, um, 
you know, shared with me when, when, when I had the interview with him, it's like the humility that he had that we have towards uh, our clients. Uh, we, we take to understand, you know, their, what they took them to where they are right now, what they are mm-hmm. doing right now, and where they plan to go. So we don't come in just as a, as a shred provider, but more as an innovation and growth funding partner where we are leveraging tax credits, grants, tax incentives, or programs to offset costs mm-hmm. along the journey. So, you know, you're not, we're not going to toss you all that is available under the sun, but more about, you know, cherry picking the ones that are relevant to you based on your product life cycle, size of the company, revenue, and ambitions, obviously. Yeah. And build a roadmap to success. Mm-hmm. I mean, this idea of co-creation, like corporate partners, uh, government partners, innovation partners from like academia and service providers like like uh, Leighton, like working together to kind of like pump up innovation and, and, and support this innovation economy that's going on right now. I mean, I think that it's so important, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we hear these stories of like, you know, these self-made millionaires, these uh, tech gurus are all self-made mm-hmm. and built all this, but... Really, it takes like a community to build a company, right? Because it, it takes so much skills, it takes so much resources, it takes so much um, so much input from a, from a from a from a especially a human capital kind of element, right? To uh, to get these things going up and going. And one of the biggest issues, you know, we were talking about this earlier, is like the is the time constraints and the skills gap that founders have when uh, they need to launch something, right? Like it's one yeah. thing to solve a problem and to launch a product or a service or an innovation into the marketplace. But mm-hmm. the whole other thing is to you know, run a business, run a corporation, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's one of the savvy, un, un, like unsavory things about, uh, you know, what we do is that you got to do this cool thing, which is like, you know, launch a great product or service that solves this problem you really care about. Mm-hmm. But you also have to like learn how to handle the mechanism behind you. The corporate mechanism, the tax infrastructure, uh, all yeah. these loose loose ties that are that are super important, right? Absolutely. And uh, working with partners is, is so important for this, right? So yeah. So the the way we come in in the picture is uh, first accelerating your growth, you know, mm. accelerating the, the the growth of the the companies we work with, simply because. You know, there's a heavy compliancy component to the, for instance, the the, the, the backbone of your innovation funding strategy. That's mm-hmm. what like that's how I like to phrase it. Uh, shred. It's just like it's a, it, you know, it's a it's a recurring scheme. Year over year, you can apply for it. So you need to have as a uh, as an early stage company, soon as you not 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 soon as you like soon as you're about to hit your first fiscal year end, you need to have a strategy. Understand uh, how the programs work because you don't want to be regretting some of the choices you made five years down the line. Because the Shred program is a great program in Canada. It's it's quite lucrative, mm-hmm. but. What the challenge is for the companies we see is because of the compliance and the, the heavy, heavily like you know do- documentation and processes in place that you need to have, you are missing out on things, right? Mm. And, and having someone who can take that off from your day to day is is a game changer. Yeah, you know when you when you come up and say you know what uh, I have four developers. And because I made the right choice on how to structure my project, because someone walked me through it, I'm getting back hundred thousand hmm. dollars. I'm giving you a random example. Yeah. Imagine your shop of four guys on payroll. How yeah. much hundred thousand dollars represent for you? Yeah. You pre rev. I'm talking about pre rev. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or you have one client, two clients bringing you like two hundred grand a year, mm-hmm. right? So imagine how important that is in your survival. And having the right person not only doing it right, but ensuring that every single like penny you are entitled to get, you know, mm, it gets claimed, yeah. Gets claimed I mean, and documented the right way. Yeah, I mean, you 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 talked uh, talked about this earlier offline when we were ta- chatting. It's like sometimes for some of your clients, it's like you found 
like two hundred thousand dollars just like sitting there. It's like it's like under the carpet. They didn't even know, right? Yeah. Because they qualify for it. They're sitting there, and you you reclaim it for them. Yeah, it's because there's also another thing is like you can actually uh, on you can apply on your own. And the thing is, you know, you as a company you can have a good understanding and okay understanding or great understanding. But you do it only for yourself, and right? mm-hmm. you have your very company-specific vision. What I like about my team and the team we have in Toronto or in Canada, you know, we do this day day out. <coughs> Pardon me. And the beauty of it, we have an industry vision. You know, we come up with a fresh eye, and regardless of how good the understanding of the client is, we we consider it. But we look at a fresh eye, and we you know, determine what is 100% eligible. We put aside what is not. Mm-hmm. And you always have those projects that are in the gray area. Mm-hmm. So our job is to make sure that if you as a client want to walk up more maximization tax of path, we can bundle those projects, structure those projects so we don't leave those costs uncleaned. Obviously, in a way that is compliant to the program, obviously documented and structured, so we can defend it comfortably if there's an audit, mm-hmm. right? So it's that's in the business model. Obviously, it's very attractive because it's a success-based business model. It's an industry standard, but we don't take any retainer. And our approach is also to have a fair, you know, percentage taken. So the idea we build a relationship along because once we started off with, you know. That's the SHRED program, which is a recurring program, but we are an innovation funding partner. Our job is also to involve, you know, a um, service line, a grant service line, where we, you know, once we understand your development roadmap, your commercial roadmap, bring up those relevant grants to you so you can, you know, shape that cost coming ahead rather than looking at, you know, recovering expenses that have been only made. So you're a bit more proactive about it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, one of the interesting things is like, like you know, Leighton is like a, is a global firm. You know, exactly. you're, you're a multinational. Um, do you do you do you have um, access or have you gotten insights into how different na- nationalities operate? Do they have? Do other countries have things similar to Shred? How does Canada's Shred program differ from other other countries? Like, what does that look like? Listen, Larry, this is an amazing question. I, I answer that probably like a dozen times a week. All right, <laughs> and. Uh, and yeah, the what what I uh, the, the Canadian program is is one of the oldest mm-hmm. uh, already tax credit scheme that exists, and it's quite lucrative compared to the ones you could find in mm. Western Europe or down south in in our neighbors in the U.S. Uh, but a little bit restrictive on what is eligible. It's like you know it's been long enough that the government has or the program has been defined in such a way. Those few things that are not eligible, certain things that are eligible, depending on industries. I'm not going to dwell into that because we're going to get into technicalities, and it's it, I don't, you know it's another conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I know is that uh, programs that are quite newer, for instance, in the U.S., a bit more, a bit less uh, lucrative, but less restrictive as well. So in some cases, we are able to advise our clients who have operations on both sides to get the best of both. So, I mean, that's interesting, right? Like, like, do you ever get clients who are, you know, they, they can claim on Canada side and the U S side or multinational side. Like, do you, like, I would, I would ask like at a certain level, you'd be, you'd be pretty big, but now, you know, companies kind of like kind of easily operate cross borders, right? Canadian companies can have U.S. employees yeah. be working from there. How does that work when it's like multinational? It, so you you have like each country has their own rule of incorporation of history, or so sometimes you you need to have a payroll in place, you need to have a structure. So for the U.S., you have like specific rules for that, and in Canada, you have specific rules. For instance. Shred, you can capture uh, only, you know, uh, Canadian, uh, like, you know, eligible work performed under payroll or under sub- uh, eligible Canadian subcontractor mm. or material cost, eligible material cost in certain industries. While in the U.S., the rules are a bit more flexible. Hmm. And 
it requires to have obviously being incorporated, for instance, in Canada being incorporated, but also having a CRM business number. Depending on which province you are, you can also have some nuances. It's pretty much the same in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So let's talk about this, like you know, going from working in a technology firm to now servicing technology companies, especially like early stage companies. Mm-hmm. What are, what are some of the the growth challenges you face? Like you know, like meeting so many different companies at one time. Like you know, like that's got to be kind of confusing for somebody who's like you know any kind of professional, right? I mean, it's uh, you, you are passionate about something at some mm. point, right? So um, I I I love um, I love video game industry. I love the <laughs> video game industry, right? So I grew up being a great gamer. You know, I played Final Fantasy to not just game whatsoever. Nice. And uh, so you know, I can relate to some extent sort of stuff. Mm. So once you're really passionate about something, you start to learn, read more, uh, grasp things that you can bring certain things to one another. And mm-hmm. what I can say is like you, you have certain things that are like uh, industry agnostic that you can bring up no matter what. And then it's more about the technical challenges or business challenges that you understand better because you specialize in an industry, right? So mm-hmm. some of the folks in our team are really good with manufacturing firms. Um, uh, the others are good with, uh, you know, life science. Some of some of them are good with uh, pharma. So each industry has their own technical, technological, or business challenges. Mm-hmm. And the way you understand it, that's how the, the relevance we can bring it. And obviously, if I'm a bit less comfortable in an industry, either I pass it on to one of my colleagues or I, I bring them in the meeting. Mm-hmm. That's, so, I mean, I think one of the interesting things, again, about your job uh, is, like, the fact that you meet so many different companies, right? So many yeah, different, yeah. Innovat- especially, the, like, in the newest cutting-edge, right, companies that are disrupting the market space in their respective industries. Mm-hmm. Anything that stands out to you that you're working with, like, or have worked with that it's just, like... Um, yeah, so one of uh, the things that amazes me is how fast uh, medtech evolves. Mm. It is, um, you know, you 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 not you cannot even dream of those things, and you have folks coming up with those great ideas that are actually needed, you know, um, from mental health to completely uh, changing the game on how you would uh, operate life from a remote, like, you know, a surgeon can operate live from distance on a very, you know, complex surgery. Mm-hmm. So those are the, you know, innovation we come across. Obviously, I cannot name any company because it's like we are under, uh, mm-hmm, under of course. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, but those are the, uh, the type of examples of prospects we meet and and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And, you know, I really love what I, uh, 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 w- w- how people are like, you know, bringing those like ideas into reality. But also what you see is like some of those industries who are like, you know, seeing like big players and like, you know, like kind of like losing their spot and being completely disrupted. And that's also, you, you can foresee kind of what's going to happen in maybe 10 years or 20 years. Mm-hmm. And that's also interesting. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, I mean coming, again, coming from the industry, like, um, are you, do you find yourself entrepreneur at all? Do you have like an itch to ever get in and uh, start your own thing? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. You know, you, you, you kind of catch ideas here and there, uh, but not, not, and you, you, you kind of also go through all that, like you see live the challenges, like, you mm-hmm. know, you have what, the facade, like that is very cool right nowadays. It's cool to be an entrepreneur. And, yeah. but, and once you, you get in the reality of it, like you see how tough it is to be an entrepreneur and like, you know, my hats off, my respect to, to all of those founders and CEOs and CTOs, CFOs I met because it's a tough job nowadays. Yeah. And, um, the, what I feel like right now, I'm much better at helping them connect with 
resources to grow mm -hmm. or at least stay afloat. That's uh, that's what what we are good at, and that's yeah. we are why I'm in business. That's why we are latent in in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I mean, it goes to the idea right, of co-creating innovation, right? Like, of, of like injecting a company. In. That's such a valuable service, right? Like, where did that lead for you, right? Like, do you do you see yourself doing this for immediate future, long term, for developing like a, getting better and better at crafting uh, companies and helping them resource that? Uh, do you see yourself like you know repositioning to um, you know within Layton and another, another uh, any other offerings coming up? Like, where does um. Where does, I guess, from Layton's perspective, how does the innovation economy, how does it evolve within the innovation landscape? So that's a great question, Ravi. So, you know, right now our topic is more about on the small, mid-sized space. But as you grow as a company, when you are starting to get in the higher end, uh, higher end of the mid-sized space, there's a plethora of services that you, that you could leverage from, you know, I'm talking about HST, GST recovery, which is very accounting, fiscal, expertise focused mm -hmm. to property tax to uh you know we're not offering all of these like like i'm, I'm naming like you have so many opportunities and uh, that you could that 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 you could leverage so as an organization you know we we start off initially when we opened in in canada we were only offering shred then we mm. added grant service line then we added sales tax recovery and we like we are looking at adding up you know, if the, it's what the market needs, we're looking at adding up those services, but they're not coming out of nowhere. Because, for instance, we historically we start off in France, and in France our portfolio is the most diverse. So we have like you know sometimes some clients have like more than ten mandates, different mandates we engage with, and we're talking about corporate now. You know, they've been in business for more than ten years. You have uh, different departments of a company that can we can we can help with. So in can in Canada we are focusing for now for innovation and a bit of sales tax recovery. Once they're a bit more in the highest space in terms of revenue, but down the line, who knows? There's mm -hmm. more opportunity to grow. So not only in terms of the number of clients, but also the the value we can bring to our clients. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like I was talking about this earlier on, uh, on a different episode, but the, the idea of innovation. Becoming a part of uh, part of Canada's uh, economic re recovery plan, All right? We're hearing a lot of talk about this, a lot of academic research, a lot of government policy being crafted towards this. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, uh, and, and I know I'm in a feeling like I, from the research I've I've gained from the federal government to the provincial government, even municipalities, mm -hmm. are waking up the prospect that you know coming out of COVID, economic recovery comes from the innovation side. It doesn't come from attracting multinationals or larger enterprises to open up new branches in within Canada. I know that's part, probably part of the plan as well, but it seems to me all aspects of government are, are geared now, are gearing themselves to supporting the innovation industry further, right? As, you know, as like the, the fourth industrial wave uh, is on us and like, you know, AI and uh, like uh, and, uh, and software is eating the world and becoming more more ingrained in all their different uh, in, in industries, right? It's, it, everybody, everyone's changing. You know, from you know, legal industry to the tax industry to uh, the actual like STEM industries, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone's kind of radically changing. They're they're morphing their capabilities of how they operate, whether it be working remote, working you know uh, within a different kind of frameworks, mm -hmm. uh, engaging with new technologies. Everything's got this constant flux. Yeah, right? yeah, but we need those changes because mm -hmm. some some of them are overdue. <laughs> <laughs> If I can phrase that way, and it's because the market needs it. Like you know, you you have like certain type of clients historically have been you know uh, not treated well mm -hmm. for the industry. Then then you have like new players coming in and you know completely changing the game. So we see them. We see them among our clients. That's that we like. And uh, and you're right when you when when you say that the government is supporting that. And to illustrate that, like um, the CRA extended the filing deadline for shred. So usually uh, for your December 2018, the initial filing deadline was was 18 months, and now they extended it to 24. So you still have some time to file your 2018 December fiscal year until December 31st this year. 
which is a very rare case. They extend it by six months. Mm -hmm. so those are the, some of the, the things the government is doing is, uh, is to make sure that you, have you, you don't miss out on the money that you are entitled to. But also they, they, they have streamlined, I'm not going into really in details, but they, they have streamlined the process in such a way that your, uh, your claims can be treated better and faster as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's for important sure. because you have some lag time between when you apply and when you're getting you know, your notice of assessment, for instance. So, so you have also the government, like you know, the federal and the provincial governments, like pushing through this thing championing that so mm -hmm. it's good to have that support in, in canada yeah definitely so i mean looking at our economic recovery right and w what's going on right do you see like one of the one of the craziest things that uh, i've recently noticed is that you know smaller municipalities like barry mm -hmm. uh, like innisfil um thunder bay sudbury like these very remote regions right compared to like uh, the greater toronto area the entire municipality is 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 look uh, gearing towards innovation and they the and the municipalities the departments even have like an entrepreneur residence or like a support st structure within the within the municipal governments to mm -hmm. help uh, facilitate like citywide innovation strategies mm -hmm. right i mean it's a federal provincial municipal level kind of mm -hmm. uh, kind of a uh, uh, kind of approach towards uh, this kind of solution right and uh, I, I like what i'm what i'm really interested in is like is innovation going to become more of more of a mainstream product right and by that i mean like look at the transition we went through like in the last industrial revolution right people we became more urban population became more urban we let go of more manual level jobs less factory jobs less like farming jobs mm -hmm. you know and people became more uh, more and more ingrained into like that white collar office job where you know you go in you know you do clock in at five but you become part of this large level corporation and you and you perform mm -hmm. that kind of executive function, right? Mm -hmm. But now, like, I feel like more and more, and like the co-founder of AngelList, Naval Ravikan, I, I follow a lot. He talks about this. It's that people are becoming more and more like uh, freelance, right? From your from your job contracts becoming more gigified and, and, and a freelance kind of position. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's it's kind of lagging. Uh, can you still hear me? Yep, I can hear you fine. Right, but like more than the freelance part of like, the career path, like you know, like People now get contract jobs, contract positions, six months, a year, two years, you know, very ethereal, ethereal relationships with their contract, with their employers. But on the other flip side, like more and more people and more and more of our economy is becoming focused towards innovation and creating new things and, and, and launching it quicker and faster. And the support structure is lowering and lowering, the, trying to lower the barrier of entry, but lowering the cost. Uh, being uh, uh, to start up, you know, from everything from co-working stations to give cheaper areas to work, right, mm -hmm. and connect, right. Uh, these programs, like like you mentioned, supporting and and refinancing uh, and and re and invigorating uh, capital investments, right, to incubators, etc., and economic environments producing um, the, the human capital and like providing the the, the knowledge and uh, mentorship and uh, and streamlining uh, streamlining the development of companies, right. Everything kind of seems to be coalescing from different different uh, different parts of corporate public partnerships towards mm -hmm. like towards having a greater and greater pool uh, like like an investor like a, like a uh, sorry a innovation class mm -hmm. of worker right and uh, like you know what do you think like do you think that it's gonna become like almost like a job title to be an innovator you know like so so just like you have a career path and like you know being an accountant or like a uh, a lawyer or something like that. You would people becoming more like entrepreneur, and they're just like building up companies and launching them, and you know working within this uh, ethereal environment to you know launch more, launch new and exciting products continuously. Yeah, that's that that's an amazing comment and question at the same time. Uh, listen, I I I see what I see is, um, and this is from coming from the field. Um, I, I, sometimes I, I see like folks engage into a legal career or med career and they, they do uh, few years. Sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt, but for some reason the, the zoom, uh, the, the picture quality seems to be uh, frozen. Uh, could you turn off your camera and turn it back on, uh, on the bottom? Yeah. Is it better now? Uh, and turn it back on. Uh, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Um, so, 
So yeah, it is. Um, it's a it's a great question and comment. Uh, you, you know, in in the companies I met, it, it, it's good to look at the profile of the founders, mm. where they come from. Um, I often see folks having initially, like you know, going you know graduating from law school and going to legal career. They do a couple of years and either they, it wasn't what they thought, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they, you know, they kind of save up and launch something with friends or like, you know, start a venture that way. Or they see a gap in the market because they have like a, like the field expertise, you know, they know mm. exactly what they're talking about. And it's like, you know, we have this amazing culture and we have those amazing entrepreneurs who are like elevated at the level of a rock stars. Mm -hmm. Right. So the you know those Elon Musk's or uh, you know Steve Jobs they, they they inspire those folks who on a daily basis I know exactly you know what uh, what mental health care space is you know I'm I'm a professional in that industry but I'm going to partner with someone who knows tech and bring my professional opinion to it and build a great product that that would fit and you know, fill in a gap in the market or in the customer's needs. And who else, who better than a doctor who, you know, to build a product that fits to their clients because he's in it. Who better than a construction worker to build a construction related software, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what I believe in is that there's no more linear career path. You have those like suddenly like, you know, little hiccups that's what used to be considered. Now mowing like a completely new branch, new opportunity in your life that opens up. Hmm. And that's what's going to happen. And that's the mindset. And you, you, you were initially going into a very techie career and suddenly you're going to have to learn business because you want to, or, or are you going to have to, like you're, you, you know, in a, in a life science career, suddenly you're going, to you're going to have to learn development because you need to, transform what you have as an idea into an app right so mm -hmm. so this is what's going to happen um elon musk mentions often like you know cross-disciplinary applications mm -hmm. like two two or more disciplines coming together to build something new and this is what's going to happen mm -hmm. right now what's happening is like everything is subject to ai yeah you know? <laughs> everything can go to machine learning Mm -hmm. Eagles from uh, you know computer vision, image analysis, whatsoever, you know. So everything's going through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about that, right? Like uh, Travis Radnam from uh, Knowledge Hook, the CEO of Knowledge Hook, like he's been messing me back and forth, and we've been discussing this, like the deep impact of AI, right? Like we keep seeing this buzzword of AI, 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 and I think the consumers are used to this concept of like, yeah, this AI is like running on this platform on that platform but the deeper impact of ai i think like we still haven't seen yet right like it's like it's like it's still in baby infancy stage and the, the effects of it is going to be deep and profound mm -hmm. so what i'm really interested in is how it's going to modify society you know any kind of deep technology change like look at like the last uh, 10 15 years right what the mobile revolution has done for us you know every one of every one of us has these mobile devices and it's changed our behaviors changed the way how we interoperate and it's you know we're completely different almost as a species than we were to 15 years ago mm -hmm. right as a society we're completely different mm -hmm. right so it's like how does this interface with machine and human right where does that lead to right the question mark comes it's like do do these deep learning systems are they you can be used as subjugators, you know, to turn to like to 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 like to um, increase the gap between the people who have and don't have, like have the knowledge, have the resources, have the skill sets to actually use the systems and and uh, and actually and, and actually deploy them, whereas people have no idea, or is it become more equilateral where the systems are deployed in a way that it benefits everybody, uh, like in a, in, a, in an equal kind of platform, right, like. How do how do we kind of pick the road we're going on as a society? I think I think this kind of conversation can become more mainstream, right? Yeah. yeah have I you? Mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, have you watched the 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 the, the movie on Netflix, um, the, so, the the social dilemma? Uh, it's 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 in my it's in my favorite. I haven't had the chance with 
with with a kid. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> the dad life. Yeah, you've been telling me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, this isn't my plan to to watch it in between the Christmas and and the New Year's break. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, Tristan Harris, uh, you know, former of Facebook, uh, he 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 joined this. Uh, he started this movement around around um, how AI systems are being utilized against us. You know, the problem is, the problem is when uh, something is free, you become the product. You know, like we we hear this adage now yeah. over and over again. But the problem is, like, you know, commoditizing humans, commoditizing people using systems, mm-hmm. right? And the, the cool thing is there's a lot of like a lot of companies, a lot of startups, a lot of founders, uh, you know, who's starting with this me- mentality of like human first. Like, you know, they're like, you know, we don't want to go that way. We don't want, you know, we want to write more transparency, more, um, more transparency, more ability for you to control your data. And I think there's there's a potential like like social revolution when it comes to the implementation of software and companies yeah. and innovation. Mm-hmm. Right. One of the things yeah. I've been following deeply is uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the, uh, the inventor of HTML, the founder of the uh, the modern internet. Um, mm. He is tackling this problem head on, right? So Tim Berners-Lee, like back in the 90s, like when the, when the web was running and like he was envisioning what what it could be, you know, he created HTML at CERN, right, the Center for European Research mm-hmm. and Innovation, and and he really gave it for free. Like on C and floppy disk, he just gave out the code for free, open sourced it, and it's like, hey, network your computer using this baseline, and we can all network together. He made the common frame for the internet, mm-hmm. and you know, he, like you know, he, as a norm, he, he did it as an open source project, and boom, this one of the largest spikes in human uh, in human intelligence and human connectivity happened mm-hmm. right over the past two two decades, and now what he's seeing is that the problem is the the coupling of data and and services is an issue so what his newest project he's actually created create a new open source project right where he's trying to decouple data from the service mm-hmm. right and it's really interesting it's called solid uh, the solid framework so it's like html it's called a solid framework so it's an open source project and he has a, a a company he runs on the side as a consultancy to help enterprises make this change Mm-hmm. And what what is so interesting, you know, we we like you said, these rock star, there's these rock star entrepreneurs, you know, who, who make the bank, who are the public traded companies, who get all these acclaim, but we forget about these academics and the researchers and these hobbyists, right, who like tinker with their technology for the betterment of all. And one of the really cool things about Solid, the Solid framework, and I really want to dive uh, d- personally more into this, mm-hmm. is that what it does is that let's say a software tool, like an app uses you know you're using it as a service what it does though is all the data being collected doesn't go to the solid uh, server directly mm-hmm. like it goes to a personal server of the user that's locked away separate that's separate from the corporate right mm-hmm. and what it does is it generates a key meant for the user so it's like the it's like it automatically creates a vault for you right so as you use the server let's say let's say a uh, zoom Right. For instance, right. Historically, has a, has like a big negative connotation about what's happening behind the scenes. Right. It's encrypted. It's not encrypted. Right. So if you're using Zoom and all your Zoom history and recordings and all that kind of stuff, if it's stored within an accessible format where you know a Zoom employee or someone who you know someone who cyber attacks the Zoom can get access to, that's mm-hmm. that's that's a that's a huge problem set. Right. Yeah. It's a problem set for Zoom. It's a problem set for uh, the, the users, it's a problem for everybody, right? So what this would do is decouple that from the company. So mm-hmm. you, the user, would actually have access to your own personal usage of that. It'd be locked away into your own personal repository. But then you're giving um, the Zoom, the corporation, access to that, permission to access it, right? And you can control the access point. So yeah. in a way, the tools becomes collector of data, but you own the data goes into your client side client side uh, you know server that you can own you, you control and operate mm-hmm. and uh, and you know and everybody gets a more transparent system yeah right. it's um, it, it, it's actually a, a completely different way of thinking and doing business um, it's kind of bringing uh, like it's not kind of it's actually bringing like a more ethical approach to uh, to doing, you know, to doing business online, mm-hmm. like, you know, to interacting online. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, 
there is this uh, famous neuroscientist, a French uh, or a neuroscientist called Idris Aberkan. He called. Uh, he, he he talks about um, like neurosagesse, which translates to uh, uh, neuro wisdom, and it calls. Uh, it can, but it, it it also mentions that there's no innovation without wisdom. Mm. Otherwise, innovation can be turned against us. Mm. We had a lot of examples in yeah. mankind's history how innovation got turned against us, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where we need to have this approach. And you know what you the example you were describing is it's the perfect approach where like the the user takes control back to his data. And yeah. this is this is a trend we we would want to see uh, in in the future. That's, yeah, uh, yeah, that's definitely something we want to see in the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, like the inventor of uh, chlorine gas, right? mm-hmm. uh, during uh, you know the mustard gas that was used in World War One, he got a, um, a Nobel Peace Award, right, yep. Peace Prize, right. He, as a chemist, uh, he discovered um, the way to synthesize uh, phosphorus in fertilizer, right. That that pretty much solved world hunger at that time, right? Like it allowed us to artificially uh, uh, to uh, nu- uh, provide nutrients into um, uh, nutrient-rich soil. That can um, that in, dra- rapidly increase the productivity of uh, of soil and fields mm-hmm. and farmland all across the world. He got a he, he got a peace prize, and a year later, right, the German military utilized his research and he actively worked on this, right. His he, he actively worked on the the, uh, the uh, he became the, fa- the father of chemical warfare, right. Yeah. And you know you have this kind of mentality where it's like you know like the technology of chemistry being utilized for such a peaceful world endearing project and within a light year that same kind of modality and, and the thought process being used to kill a lot of people you know and a novel weapon yeah right? we have we have modern examples right now with mm-hmm. with drones you know <laughs> yeah you see some scary stuff out there <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. like okay like the exit that happened at google right uh it was a, a project i forgot the project name <laughs> the project with uh, the, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, right? Google got uh, obtained this contract, multi-billion-dollar contract, to uh, build an AI system to control uh, drones, uh, pretty much automated uh, drones, like like for war purposes. Mm-hmm. And it kind of got leaked, and like hundreds of Google employees like resigned in protest, right? Yeah. And they end up dropping the project. And then end up getting the project in a, in a smaller capacity later down the road and kind of hit it. But like the whole point is like, like, you know, like Google, which became like Google is like the sage of the modern age. Right. Like it's like it's almost like God. Like you ask a, you want to ask a question, you go to Google. Right. <laughs> like like like, you know, like Scott Galloway talks about this a lot, like about like how like the power of the of the brand of Google, of Apple, of Facebook. Right. And people mm-hmm. like gravitate towards that because it's like, you know, like remember in the beginning when Facebook was like, you know, we're we're connecting people globally and like it was such a positive vibe around it yeah. and then within a span of the last two years how that's radically been destroyed how facebook is now seen as the biggest threat to democracy in all nations right and now it's it's facing um you know uh, civil lawsuits from 40 different uh united states from uh, within the united states yeah right right like so like we're i think we're seeing this culture transform like, like you said like the ethical use the ethical use of technology, it, right? The, the toughest part is that who can enforce that? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, governments are using it, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes, as you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, some, some federal agencies in the U.S. So, how, like, the question is, how can we enforce that as, as, a, as a collectivity, as a people? Mm-hmm. If, the body that is supposed to enforce it is all already yeah is utilizing not, themselves right yeah yeah right so that's uh th- that that's also another topic to discuss about a lengthy topic to discuss mm. about is like how can you enforce ethics on technology yeah you know? yeah um that's- there's a there was a really interesting uh, research proposal about this. Again, there's a lot of proposals from policy ops. Like, yeah. there's not. It's not like there's like a lack of thought behind this. There's a lot of well-rounded, like well-acclaimed, like um, academics behind this, developing the policy for how government should perform, how we yeah. should do this, you know, and all that. But the problem is leadership, 
right? Like we need, we need like, I think more, you know, that a leadership to thinking about this kind of process. And one of the disappointing things about, I guess, I guess the U S elections, right? Like, yes, Biden won, Trump is out, but there's no real, no real like forward, like, like, uh, like a, like a forward looking kind of modality of like, especially how technology landscape changes. Right. Yeah. And especially with this looming, uh, the idea of a looming, like, uh, like tech war, right? Like the, the, between China and China and the U S right. The, the 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 two tech ecosystems right that's being divided the world's being divided into right i mean you know you coming you know you're you're a fellow south asian and you probably have people back uh, probably back home and, and your friends in in different editions do you see this being a, a overly hyped concern or do you think that this is something that can spiral into something bigger um what i believe in is our leadership uh needs to be more aware of like you know hands-on into this mm-hmm. not pretend um, i'm not I'm, I'm not thinking of a specific country like globally speaking um it, it's overlooked mm-hmm. it's the importance of technology how it can influence certain things like you know elections or uh like very or like you know the how a um how a strike or demonstration is depicted. Mm. So we have to be cautious, and uh, there, there are not enough rules or like regulations to or framework. Mm-hmm. And those are the things like you know that co- needs to come forward. Yeah. That's what I believe in. Um, the, obviously, yes, there's a concern because we we only see the per, like so far. I only really have a Western perspective. Mm. But how are we seen as like living in Western countries from like, you know, you, you depicted a, you know, a antagonism between like, you know, a more like a U.S. ecosystem and, and a Chinese ecosystem. How are we seen from their perspective? Mm-hmm. Is it more of a collaboration mindset or is it still like the same way? Like, you know, are, are we seen the same way? Or are just are they just living on their own world? You know, we you know we are billion point four, we're good by ourselves. You know, so that's more of the question. Like I don't have the perspective to really. Maybe if we really knew the perspective and have a better understanding, and not told to us, but us looking at, we may have a different feeling about it. Yeah. That's what. I, yeah. That's what I, yeah, you're right, and uh, I think like uh, I think that's where it comes down to, right? Like it's a better, it's a better, it's a more, um, it, it's a broader conversation between a lot more parties, a more open, transparent mm-hmm. dialogue. I think what leads up to it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about is um, yeah. the development of uh, the space industry. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we're seeing more and more development of this. So Canada has this 2030 plan. Uh, for space, right? Mm-hmm. They launch a new agency uh, specifically for space mining operations, mm-hmm. which is so cool, all right? So, <laughs> so, right? And uh, and um, I think it was Bloomberg that did a, a great documentary series about this called Space Now, and mm-hmm. we're talking about the global space ecosystem. So, because space is such a big problem, you know, we see like you know the different bubbles. Each country is kind of pursuing its own space kind of exploration, but the the technology landscape and the people behind the scenes is, is a global kind of landscape right where a lot of the hardware funny enough a lot of the hardware for the space race right is coming from india right mm-hmm. india is india indian uh, space startups are the leaders worldwide on building nano nano robots nano satellites right uh, nano refineries for like fuel stations in space like they're, they're, there's so much innovation going on in there but I mean, and it's not like Canada is being left behind, but Canada is doing a lot of like uh, different problem sets. They're doing a lot of um, analytics, AI, and research mm-hmm. into like the sensory information. Like how do we, how do we, uh, you know, figure out where things are moving, where to fire rockets, how to like control rocket systems better, right? The informatics behind that, mm-hmm. you know, um, CDL, the Creative Destruction Lab, they ha- they recently opened up a stream just for for space, right? Space technologies, and. Like what I'm super interested in is watching is this de- industry develop into an actual system where, you know, space within our lifetime becomes like becomes commer- commoditized. 
You know? Yeah, and uh, and this is really funny you bringing that up because yesterday I've seen now like you know we I just mentioned like earlier like the application of everything that like you know that's machine learning mm. going through the machine learning process, but now we are also having how space can be involved into a very practical application, and um, I've seen that yesterday. It was it was amazing, and you know they are. Uh, they, I, they have a very specific usage out of it, and they they are combining like space imagery, and um, uh, you know, and uh, and uh, machine learning to prevent or detect wildfires early on. Hmm. And you know, you would think that it's you know it's a, this huge corporation doing it, but actually it's a very early stage startup hmm. doing. It. Right, and what what I learned yesterday is that it's getting it's not as expensive as it used to be to send mm. something up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you say, it's 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 getting commoditized, mm -hmm. and this is amazing because you're going to have also new applications on uh, on how to leverage satellites. You know, in in our daily lives, we already know about you know the GPS system now. It's been they are long enough on the, on, in the civil application, but now there's more civilian applications who are going to come around. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, one of the analogs they talk about the space race to be is um, the, the the colonization of the West in both of, of the North America, the Canadian West versus the American West, right? So, um, you know. To all, to anyone that's interested in history of this side, right? Like, how Canada, like, you know, settled the Western colonies because right? everyone came on the Eastern seaboard, right? Mm -hmm. All settlers came from the Eastern seaboard, from, mostly from Europe. So the settlers came in and moved west. Canada, you know, was systematic by the Western expansion, right? The government set up forts and sent military and set up roads and infrastructure. The church went and put up churches and uh, and places to, uh, to rest and you know there was infrastructure put in place before the people came yeah. right so therefore it was a slower growth curve but more predictive more safer and uh, more guaranteed mm -hmm. and that's how Canada, Canada Canada moved into the west of course there was the displacement of the native population but that's a different yeah. story but uh, in in America it was a completely different uh, method of doing it right like the the free enterprise model of America was really captured in this, right? The Wild West, where mm -hmm. the people went before there was any resources, before there was any support, before there was even government involved, right? Into lawless territory. What ended up happening is free enterprise people, right? Like there was literally like, you know, corporations win the right, you know, to transport people to their new lands. The government will give you new land if you can go and settle it and claim it, right? Like. Mm -hmm. They were giving out the rights for it and created it and used the free enterprise of individuals to go and conquer it, go claim it, go settle it and create, you know, and then and then only after people settled and like, you know, like lived in lawlessness and like, <laughs> and, you know, tried to like, you know, go after these gold rushes and and try to claim as much resources as they could and much land as they could, did the government come in and formalize uh, yes. a system it was uh, put into place. Right. And these two analogs between these two different ways to conquer the West is seeing what the space race is going to look like. Right. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be, you know, governments working together, building infrastructure, building ports, building, you know, like, you know, uh, building rescue vehicles, all that kind of stuff. Right. And then being able to send up resources, not even people, maybe machines first, but still, have, you know, mm -hmm. being coordinated on that. Or is it going to be a rush all right, a free enterprise model where governments were like, yeah, if you land on that uh, on a rock that's flying, you know, in space. It's yours, you know. You yeah. own the mining rights to it, so go get it. And it's like a, it's like a, you know, gunshot goes off and the races start, and people are like yeah, just yeah. launching stuff left, right, and center, trying to claim as much as they can. And then you know, like piracy mm -hmm. can happen up there, and there's a lot of stuff that can happen up there, and there's no real levels. And again, mostly it's going to be robots that are being sent up there. But yeah. I, I, I like what I'm really curious to see is like how coordinated versus uncoordinated we're going to be, because that's going to set the tone of like yeah. of space exploration right so the, the complexity here is that canada was one country and you know that happened this move to west happened you know within one country same thing for the us 
Mm. Now the space, we're talking about, you know, few players there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> U.S., obviously, China, Russia were the main players historically. Then you have yeah. India and also, I mean, Europe as well. And then a few smaller players who are, have the acclaim. Now look at the complexity, right? So having more like the Canadian historical approach could be complex because you have to agree on certain resources together to get there. Mm -hmm. So what, to me, what could lead into a rush, and it's more like from, let, let's say, uh, let's call it an educated guess. Um, let's say one of the players found valuable resources either like, you know, on the moon or some, some flying object, and they know exactly how to land, um, I believe that's where an actual race may happen if we don't have kind of a international agreements on how to collaborate on this. If there's no rules, there's no law. And if someone finds something that, you know, we had that in the gold rush, mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen. If we don't agree, as like you know, as like a gentleman agreement or at least an international treaty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like it comes down to that level of coordination, right? And what we're seeing is like what suddenly we've been thrust into, and I think COVID nineteen accelerated this, is the denaturing of like of government uh, contracts, right? Like uh, like a lot of things are now up in the air. Right, mm -hmm. uh, like old treaties are being put put aside. Uh, there's something called the law of the sea, right? Uh, the, uh, that's a shared document, that's a shared law that all countries have signed, except the United States. The United States has not signed this. Yeah. So what what uh, nations have uh, have signed and under this treaty would protect is that within a certain kilometers of your border yeah. of, as a nation, the sea, I think it's like 20 kilometers out, is your coastal waters. It's your territory. Yeah. And then there's an expansion zone, like, um, you know, your continental zone, I think it's called. It's mm -hmm. like it's like 200 kilometers out from your the, from your border, from, yeah. your, from, the, from your closest land. It's, it's still your property. Like, it's still yours. You have rights, uh, right to the, the economic output. Like, you can mine from there. Like, any kind of resources belongs to the country. But um, foreign vessels can come in there. Right, like if they if need to be like like you know like especially civilian uh, civilian uh, civilian vessels without having to uh, uh, to signal right can come into there uh, as long as they let you know they're there. But mm -hmm. again, military vehicles are not uh, military CSC vehicles are not allowed. So, anyways, it's, it's general territory. But the main point is that up to 200 kilometers outside of your coastal waters, you can uh, you have access to mining rights. And where we're seeing is that. The Northern Territories, so mm -hmm. the Arctic Circle is now one of the biggest gold rushes we're seeing because the Arctic ice is all melting and all the resources under all that ice is now accessible. Plus the trade, right? It's much easier to trade up there, right, than going down to the pa Panama Canal, right, yeah. to get to to get to get to um, uh, to Asia. So now Asia, Europe. Uh, you know, and even Russia and that and the entire northern hemisphere can trade better and more easily with with Asia, and, mm -hmm. and so back and forth. So we're seeing this like 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 huge interest in the Arctic Circle and what's going to happen to that. And three companies, uh, three countries are at the, uh, at the stake behind this. Russia has the biggest stakes in this. Russia, Denmark, and Canada, yeah. right? And all three nations are now filing for motions to get, get captures. One of the, uh, one of the you remember like. Uh, Back like a few a few years ago, uh, Donald Trump put out this tweet out about buying uh, Denmark, right? Uh, like, and like you know, he made like everyone was joking about it. But behind the joke was that the reason is that that area is going to become very very interesting mm -hmm. when it comes to trade, when it comes to resources. There's 40 trillion dollars worth of like resources buried like under the ice, right mm -hmm. under like under that coastal waters. And Canada has the biggest claim to this, right? So. That is kind of like the justification of what's going to happen up in space, you know, trying to figure out how to navigate, who owns what, figuring out how those laws work, you know, like, you know, those if those deals are going to be kept up or not, um, you know, like how we arbitrage that, how we, how, how uh, jurisdiction works, right? We're going to see this in the modern age that we haven't, we haven't really taught, we haven't really dealt with uh, as, as, as nation states in a few hundred years, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. going to be interesting. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> For yeah. sure. Sorry, man. We 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 kind of 
spun off on a little bit of topics. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a very interesting topic. Um, you know, it's, it's always back in our heads. Like, you know, we, we are really caught into our day to day. Mm. But sometimes you, 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 you lift up your head and you, you're seeing those, like those things out there. And yeah. uh, you, you remind yourself there's bigger things happening right now. Right? Yeah. So, and, but what I say is just like all those small innovations I'm seeing on a day to day basis, sometimes they contribute to those bigger things. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a cascading effect, right? All those small things, like you know, they push the needle, they, they move us forward in a, in a general direction towards, you know, the bigger, the bigger drops, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Perfect. So I, I want to leave off with one main question, right? Like again, you yeah. see this landscape, uh, what's going on and what's changing, right? Um, what, like, do you like, you know, you see these like. Uh, accelerators and regional uh, regional partners coming involved, right? Is there any particular region or a particular uh, area, like physically, that you see innovation happening that's really exciting? Obviously, Waterloo. Yeah. Water, obviously, Waterloo. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I would say the the GTA. Like you know, uh, mm-hmm. when I look at from a North American perspective. Amazing the pool of talents we have. The what like I'm literally here on the ground. Mm. Like you know, I can see like companies that are uh, that are two folks when I started. Now they are like seventy. Yeah, you know, in a time span of a year or a year and a half, mm-hmm. they they have like seven figure revenues and mm-hmm. and it's happening here in Toronto. Yeah, you know, and it's there's there's a demand for like innovation there's like you know there's a clientele and toronto and the greater toronto area is a great place in north america like you have a pool of talent you have the the, the, the enough like you know big enough market uh you have like you have amazing entrepreneurs and you have also like a very supportive ecosystem mm-hmm. and uh you, you I'm, I'm probably using one the example of uh, like certain certain founders uh, who are decided to, you know, originally from Toronto, decided to come back from the Silicon Valley here. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a bold choice. You should think about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, and, and, uh, if I remember the quote is like, would you rather be a, a, a small fish in a big pound, pound or a big fish in a small pond? Mm. And the, the answer that, I can't remember which founder gave it, but the answer he gave doesn't matter. The idea is like, what is the perspective of that pound? Is it going to grow or not? And how mm. is it growing, right? And what I like about it, like Toronto is the fa- one of the fastest, not the fastest growing ecosystem in North America. Yeah, yeah. So it's an amazing place to be. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you want to be close where the action is, where yeah. the growth is happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a really good uh, good insight. Right? I, I like <laughs> that quote. Right? It doesn't matter how big the size of the bond, it matters how fast it's growing. Yeah. yeah. So if you're there at the right time, you know, you, 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 you're getting the land share. Absolutely. Perfect. Alex, man, this has been great. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, stick, up, stick around for about five minutes. We're going to do a quick debrief. But yeah. that, everyone who uh, listened in, uh, thank you for joining us. This is Alex from Layton. If you need help with Shred and kind of that kind of uh, uh, getting money back from the government, this is the, this is the man. <laughs> <laughs>